Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the weekly episode of the Rose and Rubini podcast. As always, my name is Manas Chavla, uh, and I'm joined uh, this time from New York uh, by CEO and head of research, Brunella Rosa. This week, we'll be uh, taking on the policy uncertainty that dominates the recent IMF meetings. Brunella, you've just attended these. Uh, I'd love to sort of hear your kind of firsthand view of these, uh, because I, I believe it's the first time it's happening in person in three years. Uh, mm-hmm. As usual, the IMF released its sort of uh, big, you know, uh, report, the World Economic Outlook. This time it was titled Countering the Cost of Living Crisis, a very kind of relevant title, especially to those of us living in the UK. Uh, yes. tell, me, tell me more about this report. What was new about it? Well, the report clearly has to uh, deal with the ongoing crisis. That There are at least two of them out there. One is the war in Ukraine and the associated energy crisis and the inflation crisis, so to speak, which was partly exacerbated by the war in Ukraine and the energy crisis, but it was already present as a result of the pandemic and, and the various um, uh, supply side shocks that we have discussed for many years. In some cases, also demand side shocks, such as excessive um fiscal stimulus provided by some government, for example, in the US. So clearly we are in the presence of what? Decelerating economy and uh, accelerating inflation, which is the reason why the IMF, when they published the result, uh, the report, had to update their forecast consistently with a sort of stagflationary shock, such as the one that we are uh, observing. So an upward uh, revision to the inflation forecast and a downward revision to the uh, growth forecast. Just to give you an idea, in particular, while uh, uh, world uh, GDP growth has uh, remained more or less uh, constant around 3.2% in terms of forecast, uh, 2023 forecast, so for next year, GDP is expected to decelerate from 2.9% the mm-hmm. forecast in uh, July to the 2.7 percent of the forecast in October and it's very likely that these downward revisions uh, are not uh, finished as, as time progresses. Right um, you know lots of these sort of discussions that we're having around the IMF uh, might seem a little bit uh, you know like old kind of myths coming to the fore again. Uh, I recall in March uh, you wrote a piece uh, where, you know, you should have uh, paid attention to these two uh, competing policy demands, you know, the, the having to make this very precarious balancing act between tending to monetary policy and fiscal policy, and how ultimately policymakers would have to compromise somewhere uh, to achieve some sort of a mix. Tell me a bit more about that dilemma, and how do you see it playing out in kind of the current geopolitical and macroeconomic environment? Sure. So in March, we wrote this piece. Uh, title is there an optimal policy mix to get the global economy out of the current difficult conjuncture long title to say is there a way to get out of this mess um, and the answer that we provided to our certain readers was uh, no unfortunately the reasons which means that it's not like in 2008 2009 for example where there was an optimal policy mix but some countries did not adopt it. For example, in Europe, we should have had fiscal easing and monetary easing. Instead, we had fiscal mm-hmm. tightening and monetary easing. So we could have uh, had uh, an optimal response, but we didn't have. In this case, instead, it's not possible because policymakers want to achieve what? Uh, higher, stronger growth, lower inflation, low, or at least lower, long-term interest rates, and then sanctioning Russia, punishing Russia for the illegal invasion of Ukraine. And of course, all these things are interconnected. And you only have monetary fiscal policy at your uh, disposal for so many objectives. I'm simplifying here because, of course, also monetary fiscal policies within them have other, um, how can I say, hidden policy areas, if you want. But just to make it simple, the idea is that there are way too many goals and not enough instruments. In this case, uh, mathematically means that the inversion of the matrix instruments versus objectives cannot occur. If it cannot occur, it means that you cannot optimize. This seems all awfully theoretical when we publish in March, although we kind of run the alarm bell, but um, it became very 
self-evident, super clear to everybody with the example of what happened in the UK. When monetary and fiscal policy went boom, uh, the log hurt and uh, there was a huge conflict that um, uh, was reflected in the dynamics of pound and uh, long-term rates. So, and the, if, of course, the Bank of England had to stop in. So effectively, what seemed like a theoretical paper a few months ago, it became kind of uh, 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 a very practical uh, paper a few months later. Yeah, it's materializing in front of our eyes. Uh, you know, you mentioned the UK, uh, and there's a whole kind of political conversation that needs to be had, perhaps at a separate time, about Liz Truss, but on the yeah. economic front. Uh, you know, Jeremy Hunt has been appointed as a new chancellor after Kwasi Kwarteng had to be you know, essentially ousted for a plan that they'd made together. Uh, what Jeremy Hunt seems to have, you know, mostly you turned on almost all of the, what, you know, was meant to be a mini budget. Uh, what do you make of this in the near future? Is, the, is that going to be enough to, to pull the sort of Tory party back on track and to put the economy back on track? So, uh, yeah, so you correctly identify the story there and so I'm not gonna kind of repeat it but the point that was adamant to everybody was that the policy choices that were made were wrong somebody had to pay for it it's likely the, the prime minister should pay for it but as it always happens in politics you first start blaming somebody hoping to save your life and then see whether you can make it I'm not sure that uh, Liz Truss will eventually make it maybe the party will keep her there until the elections, she loses the elections and therefore then the party is ready to kind of start his years in opposition again with the new leadership until they re become credible again uh, in a few years time. But clearly the amount of uh, distress that this has caused to the economy and financial markets and investors and so on will not be forgotten easily. So uh, clearly, the Tory party will keep this kind of stigma for some time. Right. And on the economic front, I mean, what what can, you know, what, what can we expect on the horizon? What can the central bank do and what do you expect it to do? So the, uh, the first step was for the government rather than the central bank to backtrack on the policy decisions they were announced. And this has largely happened and will be further confirmed by the budget whenever it is uh, issued towards the end of the month, uh, <laughs> which is kind of ironic in the sense that this should have been the flagship policies of the Tory government led by Liz Truss. And guess what? Uh, all this has been trashed and actually going to reverse with Jeremy Hall now needed to find further resources from uh, not tax cuts, but expenditure cuts just to finance uh, the, what's uh, what's left of the fiscal reform that they had in mind, which is very little. And but most importantly, to finance the repair of the damages that have been made by what happened in the last few uh, days in, in the UK. So, and the Bank of England has no other option than continue increasing interest rates just to keep inflation under control. All right. Um, like we said before, this kind of theoretical dilemma of having to balance two competing parties is becoming very material again. And, uh, you know, we've discussed in previous podcasts and episodes the sort of confluence of the macroeconomics and the geopolitics interacting with each other in the most dynamic way in front of our eyes, uh, which perhaps before were more separate and independent. Uh, making, you know, your advice and insight all the more necessary. So thank you so much for that, Bruno. Thank you very much. Until next time.